Cross, Waterloo, Victoria and Clapham Junction. Departure points for the south, clattering and swaying over a mass of tracks that could take you to Dover, Brighton, Southampton or westward to Exeter. This is the Southern Railway. Despite British Rail's abortive efforts to convert many coal-burning steam locomotives to oil, diesel-powered engines were gradually taking over. Phased out over an eight-year period, British Railway's last steam locomotive ran in 1966. towed in. Others came under their own steam, taking themselves sadly to the graveyard. Like the horse before them, they had served us with unwavering loyalty, only to be cast on the scrap heap. Barry Island on the Severn Estuary where the ghosts of a billion miles are burned away in the heat of the cutting torch. From as far afield as the highlands of Scotland and the flat fenlands of East Anglia, they came to stand and wait. For most of us, the loss of steam went virtually unnoticed but some appreciated that to lose it forever would be like throwing away a masterpiece. Acres of steel waiting to be cut up and thrown back into the furnace in which they came. However, for some, there is life after death. Rescued by those whose love of steam went beyond nostalgia, many of these locomotives are running today on reopened branch lines all over the country. Let's look back at the Southern Railway and its branch lines. Formed in 1923 by the amalgamation of three mainline railways as part of the grouping, the Southern, in its 25 years up to nationalization, was to become the most go-ahead railway company in the land. Fanning out from London, the area encompassed Dover to the east, previously the South East and Chatham Railway, to just beyond Exeter in the west, once the domain of the London Southwestern and the old London Brighton South Coast lines in the middle. Of the four group companies, the LMS, the LNER, the Southern and the Great Western, probably the Southern had the toughest job of reorganization. In some instances, the conversions were comparatively easy, but more than a touch of paint would be required to sort out the dreadful shambles that had become their inheritance. Some of the locomotives, especially those from the run-down Southeast and Chatham line, were more than 40 years old, and within a year, the situation had deteriorated so badly that Parliament had threatened the company with nationalisation. Then, under the skilfully adept management of Sir Herbert Walker, previously in charge of the London and South Western, and the brilliance of Maunsell, his chief engineer, the Southern Railway pulled itself together and started to make money. Since their beginnings, the enormous spread of railways throughout the British Isles had brought a new age of travel, 
making accessible within hours cities and towns that previously took days by horse-drawn coach. At the turn of the century, it seemed everyone wanted their own railway, and tracks were laid over hill and dale without any cohesive plan. Eventually, it became obvious that this could not be allowed to continue. So in 1923, the many main and branch lines were brought together under the so-called grouping to be split into four large conglomerates, London, Midland and Scottish, London and Northeastern, the Great Western and the Southern. The enormous multiplicity of track laid down in the south of England in the 19th century, and in particular the mad duplication of lines serving the towns of East Kent, was due to commercial competition being allowed to run riot. Such was the reason for the near bankruptcy of the South Eastern Chatham Railway, an amalgam of the London Chatham and Dover and the South Eastern. As separate entities, they fought each other tooth and nail in an effort to be first to reach each town and capture the revenue on their crazy race for the coast. The inhabitants of these towns were quite happy to have two stations from which to choose, but the shareholders were not, finally sacking both managers and forming a committee to run both lines. It was situations like this that led to the grouping. For Britain at war, this madness proved to be a lucky break. When German bombers knocked out a section of track, the Southern Railway could always find an alternative route to get through to the South Coast ports. For Maunsell, held down by the financial constraints of the near bankrupt Southeastern Chatham, his appointment to Sir Herbert brought him into an environment where his at times revolutionary ideas were given credence and allowed to flourish. One of the main objectives of the grouping was faster journey times along with a generally improved service. Made well aware by the threat of nationalisation, but for the Southern, this objective was imperative for their survival. Maunsell was set the difficult task of finding from within the antiquated locomotives at his disposal, one with sufficient power to haul fast trains to meet boats at Dover, Folkestone and Southampton, as well as heading the West Country Expresses. He found the right combination in the N class, a 460 locomotive already in use on the Western line. But the loco did not as yet have the kind of power they were looking for. Maunsell made modifications to the cylinders and valves, plus some minor but revolutionary alterations. The results were phenomenal, and the publicity department rounded off the achievement by naming these new engines after the Knights of the Round Table, King Arthur, Sir Gawain, Sir Lancelot, Sir Kay, Sir Lamiel and others. And so were born the King Arthurs, a class of locomotive whose prowess was to set them forever in the forefront of steam. The London and South Western, the senior partner of the Southern Amalgamation, had many years prior to the grouping seen the possibilities of extending their influence beyond the shores of England and had in fact already engineered the docks that changed the small Hampshire town of Southampton into a city. Now with the increasing public interest in travel and a potential increase of revenue, the Southern improved and extended the docks along the south coast and went into the ferry business. Within their first 10 years, the Southern Railway had become a viable and efficient enterprise, and Sir Herbert Walker began looking inward for a way of improving the system within the London commuter belt. Mainly the province of the now defunct London, Brighton and South Coast Railway, the meandering loop lines that wander through South London were served by small tank engines that were now becoming obsolete. Here again was the need for a new type of engine, one capable of handling the constant stop-start of suburban line working without adding to fuel costs. 
Sir Herbert took a fresh look at some experiments in electromotive power conducted some years before by the London and South Western. Continued development of the electric train seemed to show the way ahead, and 1933 saw the electrification of the direct line from London to Brighton and the inauguration of the Brighton Bell. Distinctive in her own particular livery of dark coffee and cream, she was a Pullman Express and the showpiece of the Southern Railway. A little more expensive to ride than a normal train, she possessed the air of a luxury hotel on wheels, conveying her passengers in supreme comfort from London to Brighton in just under the hour. In her near 40 years of service, she found a special place in the hearts of her regular commuters causing much despair and sadness when, at last, in 1972, she was declared no longer serviceable and uneconomic to repair. Pullman coaches were used extensively by the Southern, both for their boat trains, such as the Golden Arrow to Dover, and the regular run westward. An American company, Pullman provided coaches all over the world wherever luxury with superlative comfort were in demand. Built of varnished teak with vertically ellipsed beveled glass windows on the end, they were strikingly different from the norm and were used on such famous trains as the Orient Express. While the southern management concentrated on establishing their main line and ferry services, the branches were left very much to themselves, perpetuating an often lethargic but nonetheless essential link between the small towns and their connections to the various mainline stations. Some branches had spurned the offer of amalgamation extended to them in 1923, deciding instead to stay independent, one in particular remaining resolutely so. Established in 1900 by Colonel H.F. Stevens, the Rother Valley Railway wandered from its mainline connection at Roberts Bridge through a quiet backwater threading its way among the hop fields of Kent to the small town of Tenterden. Colonel Stevens ran his railway right up to nationalization in 1948. The line was never prosperous, and this showed in the antiquated locomotives and rolling stock rooms. Collected from any source available, all kinds of second-hand engines were used, many of them antiques, even in the 20s. Coaching stock again was varied, some of which one might now term collector's items. Unable, perhaps, to purchase new engines, the Colonel seems to have had the occasional clean sweep by, instead, changing the name of the railway. The Rother Valley becoming the Tenterden Town in 1903, deviously altering the name of that town station to Rolvenden. Then, in 1905, having built the connection to Headcorn, he changed the name again, this time calling it the Kent and East Sussex. For over 50 years, the line continued to provide a passenger service, then carried on for a few more carrying freight before the British Rail, that was finally closed in 1961. Ten years after closure, the quiet and picturesque town of Tenterden got back its steam railway, when once again under private ownership, the Kent and East Sussex Railway opened its first two and a half miles of relay track. Enthusiasts found, waist deep in weeds in long forgotten sidings, and at the back of engine sheds abandoned to birds and mice, a veritable treasure trove of railway memorabilia. Now the varied collection of locomotives and rolling stock, some of it from far afield, such as the Great Western Pannier Tank, no longer seem out of place. Thank <laughs> you. 
Even this American switcher tank, Wainwright, becomes acceptable in the context of a museum. This Terrier-class locomotive was built at Brighton in December 1872. It was later purchased by Colonel Stevens in 1901 and named Bodium after the nearby castle. Here, it's in the original colours of the Kent and East Sussex Railway. The back-breaking work of laying track and the mucky job of cutting channels to take the necessary cables. The laborious task of setting up signals Clean, polishing, servicing engines, and rolling stock. Everyone driven by the power of enthusiasm and the joy of seeing your work as part of the whole and its contribution to the reclamation of steam. But the Kent and East Sussex were not alone in their endeavour. A little further south into Sussex, the Bluebell Line had been shoveling coal for more than 10 years. The branch originally ran from East Grinstead to Lewis, but by 1958, British Rail, having realised their future lay in long-distance, high-speed travel as an answer to the growing competition from road transport, had, despite many protests, closed it down. These protesters, however, were not to accept the loss of their railway without putting up a fight. And two years later, the section between Sheffield Park and Horsted Keynes was leased from British Rail and the Bluebell Line reopened. Unlike the Kent and East Sussex, and due no doubt to continued negotiations over the closure, British Rail had not yet got around to removing the trap, which meant the local populace got their railway back virtually intact. With well-laid and serviceable track, the Bluebell Railway is able to run much heavier trains than the Kent and East Sussex, which is why when Tenterton rescued from Barry Island one of Maltzell's U-class locomotives, number 1618, and found it too heavy to run on their line, they offered it to the Bluebell, where it can now be seen in its true setting. Looking back to the 20s, Maunsell, as with engineers on other systems, was continuing with the modification and development of the locomotives at his disposal while placing orders for new locos that embodied these improvements. By this means, locomotives that had started out in the later part of the 19th century could still be seen working freight trains. 
even some branch line passenger services. In 1926, Maunsell brought out his new model, a 460 Express engine looking very similar to the King Arthur class. The Lord Nelson was at that time the most powerful locomotive in Europe, but somehow it never came up to expectations. Whereas the school's class was different, and for Maunsell, undoubtedly his finest work. Named after the famous public schools of England, his 440 design was superlative proving to be the most powerful and reliable engine of its class in the whole of Europe. Designed by Stroudley and built at Brighton in the mid to late 1800s, the Terrier tank was to be seen all over the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway, its short wheelbase making it particularly useful on tight curved branch lines and short run commuter sections around South East London. Bluebell's Terrier, Stepney, was still running on the line when British Rail closed it and like its sister engine, Bodium, on the Kent and East Sussex, one of the first engines to run on the reopened line. 1937 saw the retirement of Maunsell and the establishment of the most worthy successor to the position of chief engineer to the Southern Railway. Again, they'd found an innovative and brilliant engineer in Oliver Bullock. Despite the war and its inherent chaos and confusion, Bullitt was to come up with something new and exciting. Apart from his corrective methods and improvements to Maunsell's Nelsons, when he at last got them going properly, he designed the Merchant Navy or Battle of Britain class Pacific. First appearing on the tracks in 1941, these engines were unusual in many respects. Immediately noticeable are the wheels. Cast in the manner of the American-style box pot steel wheel, they were much lighter than the normal spoke variety. Bullitt's previous association with the LNER and Sir Nigel Gresley's streamlined A4s led him perhaps to the remarkable styling of the body, encasing the boiler in an all-enveloping shroud. But to a railway engineer, it was the complete lack of any outside valve gear that made him sit up and take notice. Bullitt's use of oil-immersed chain-driven valve gear, such as that used in motor cars, was a complete innovation. Fast and reliable, they gave excellent service right up to the last days of steam on British Rail. But when the chain snapped, they really broke down many were later equipped with more conventional outside reciprocating valve gear. Streamlining also proved a bit of a nuisance when it came to servicing and eventually it was removed altogether. Bullitt's reasons for using lightweight wheels become obvious when one considers he also produced a lightweight Pacific to the same design that could negotiate the estuary at Barnstable without demolishing the bridge. The West Country class was almost identical in appearance to the Merchant Navy, but slightly smaller and therefore lighter. One hundred and forty of these engines were produced, their streamlined cladding making them unmistakable, even at a distance. Bullitt's achievements in creating a distinctively southern locomotive brought about the establishment of the Bullitt Society, a body dedicated to the appreciation of his work.
When, in 1967, British Rail began sending their steam locomotives to Barry Island for scrapping, the Society made an offer for Blackmore Vale, a West Country class loco built at Brighton in 1946. They paid, at scrap value, £1,900 for the hull, and took it away to the headquarters at Longmore. Passed to the Bluebell Line for a rebuild, she has now returned westward to her more natural habitat on the Swanage Railway. Longmore was a private railway owned by the Ministry of Defence, joining the main London Portsmouth line at Lys. It ran as a training ground for the Royal Corps of Transport. Plenty of interesting motive power could be seen there, including this rare 210 built by the North British Locomotive Company, and specially built to army specifications for easy servicing in the field. Before the line was closed in 1969, it had been host to a few privately owned locomotives, all of which have long since been removed. Just a few remnants of the line are all that remain today. Certain non-public service lines did not come under the great purge of nationalisation, continuing to function in their normal capacity, providing essential services within the confines of their particular branch. Obviously, the coal board, with its own fuel supply, was not about to relinquish steam power altogether and for a short while retained the services of its J-94 tank engine for general duties. Where a spark emitted from a firebox or chimney would be a hazard, as in such establishments as a chemical works or oil refinery, this unusual locomotive, seen here at a paper mill at Swanscombe in Kent, carries no fire, receiving its power instead direct from the factory's boilers. Built by Andrew Barclay at Kilmarnock, this strange-looking engine has a working duration between top-ups of approximately 45 minutes. On a freezing cold winter's day, a saddle tank hauls a train of gypsum from a cement works on the Thames estuary to meet up with the main line. The branch is still in use, but steam has been replaced by diesel power. The southern management, concentrating on their mainline services, had allowed the branches to settle into decline. Yet they continued to provide a service. Commuters still use them, but less and less frequently. 
picture of the lazy, sleepy, little-used lines that carried the milk and a couple of pigs to the nearest market town was showing up on the audit books. When, in 1948, the Southern Railway under nationalisation became the Southern Region, under the management of the British Transport Executive, the branch lines lost their goodwill mandate and came under the scrutiny of the Accounts Department. The writing was on the wall. Throughout the 50s, the branch lines began to disappear. Little by little, the system was eroded. By 1960, most of them had already gone. Riding, bumping and swaying under the trees between wild flowered banks among the hop fields, these lines were quietly picturesque, reveling in the rural atmosphere of the Kentish wheel. Sadly, they'd been so long established, they were part of life itself. The closures continued. Nineteen sixty one was a bad year for the branch lines. One of the many closures was the line that linked Hawkehurst to Paddock Wood via Cranbrook and Goudhurst. All that remains of it now within a timber yard where once stood Hawkehurst station is this signal box. And at the other end, a short section of track that rates nothing more than a siding. The day the last train ran, many turned out to say farewell. The people of Paddock Wood, seemingly not too upset, for they were on the main line. But those at Hawkehurst felt suddenly isolated and cut off. Yet their cries of protest went unheeded, and their railway was lost forever. From Wareham on the main line between Bournemouth and Weymouth, they ran a branch to Swanage by a Corf Castle, a small town that nestles beneath the hill on top of which stands the gaunt white relic from which it derives its name. It was almost certainly its connection to the seaside resort of Swanage with its potential revenue that saved the line from immediate excommunication. Steam was taken off and replaced by an electric shuttle service. This continued to run on the line until the final shutdown in January 1972. But by July of 76, a small group of people with a great deal of enthusiasm got their first steam locomotive to run on a newly laid 100-yard section of track. 
and the Swanage line was born. Another branch of the old Southern Railway, previously the London and South Western, but still remains in part, is the mid Hance Railway. The Watercress Line, as it's become known, weaves its way through the clear, fresh water ponds of the largest watercress beds in the country. Closed in 1973, a three-mile section of track was reopened between Arlesford and Brockley in 1977, and in 1985, the now privately owned Watercress Line made the link with British Rail running into Platform 3 at Alton Station. Due to the acquisition of the Southampton Dock by the London and South Western Railway, the building and expansion of that dock, and the construction of the dock at Dover, plus the fact they occupied the region from London to the south coast, the Southern Railway became Great Britain's ambassador. days when people travelled across the world in ocean liners, they were met by the Southern Railway, ushering friend, visitor, and diplomat through the English countryside with a pace and style that gave the world its perspective of England.
The Southern Railway was indeed the epitome of British enterprise, demonstrating that innovation and expertise, along with good management, may achieve excellence in the memory of a nation.